Okay, welcome everyone for today's uh, BAA seminar. Uh, today we uh, are pleased to have Kyle Kramer, uh, Dr. Kyle Kramer from Caltech as our speaker. Um, so I um, had a lot of uh, close connection with Kyle. I, we worked a lot together um, when I was at Northwestern and also afterwards. Uh, Kyle, uh, even, so when I met Kyle, he was a student, and even then I knew he was special. And uh, that reflects uh, quite accurately because he managed to bag the NASA Einstein Fellowship, NSF Astronomy and Astrophysics Postdoctoral Fellowship, the Carnegie Fellowship in Theoretical Astrophysics, Caltech Barke Fellowship. So any one of these fellowships uh, typically make a graduate student pretty happy and he backed four of them. And uh, he is planning to use them sequentially. So he is all set for quite a while. He, uh, without stress, he can go on doing his work. So it's a pleasure to see Kyle and I look forward to hearing what he has to say. Kyle, over to you. All right, great. Thanks for the uh, nice introduction, Sharav. It's uh, very nice to join you all today. It's too bad I can't visit in person, but it's also uh, kind of cool to be able to join halfway across the world from my my, uh, my house here in California. So um, thanks for joining today. Um, certainly feel free if any of you have questions throughout the talk to just interrupt me. Um, very happy to be interrupted and answer questions. The important thing is that I can be as clear as possible. Um, so um, I wanna just start with a quick outline of the, the things I'm gonna be discussing. Um, so the main, the main topic that I've uh, spent most of my time thinking about the past few years is um, the n-body dynamics relevant in dense star clusters, in particular, uh, clusters similar to the globular clusters that are observed in the Milky Way. Um, so I wanna start by just sort of giving a very basic overview of um, star clusters and why um, they're interesting for many reasons in astronomy. Um, and then the specific sort of niche of this, this field of star cluster dynamics that I've been um, especially interested in is the dynamics of compact object populations in these systems. Um, so I want to talk a bit about how many compact objects um, of varying types, neutron stars, black holes, and white dwarfs, we expect to be uh, found in typical globular clusters um, at present day. Um, and then also discuss ways that we can actually observe these, um, these compact objects, especially the black holes, which are, um, don't have obvious ways of detecting them um, as isolated objects. Um, as I'll talk a little a bit about also, um, these compact objects are not merely passive observers within their um, host star clusters, but they actually play a really crucial role in the dynamics of the overall host clusters that they, that they live in. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about ways that especially the black holes actually influence uh, the overall large scale dynamics of the host clusters that they are found in. Um, and then what I think is probably the most exciting application of this idea, this topic of compact objects in star clusters, is the applications to gravitational wave astronomy. Um, so I'm going to make the somewhat um, uh, speculative and bold claim that potentially all of the LIGO-Virgo gravitational wave sources that have been observed could potentially have formed dynamically in environments like the globular clusters that we observe in the Milky Way. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the future prospects for this field, um, thinking especially about some of the proposed and upcoming gravitational wave detectors like LISA that will be observing these gravitational wave sources like binary black holes at lower frequencies. So I almost certainly am not gonna have time to get to uh, number four here, um, but I wanna mention at least briefly at the beginning, just so I mention it at least, um, at least once, uh, there are many other topics, especially related to um, electromagnetic transient astronomy, that um, are um, play that are playing a role and are relevant to this topic of compact objects and clusters. Um, just recently, um, this past year, 
there was a fast radio burst observed in a globular cluster in the nearby galaxy M81. So thinking about ways that these compact object populations can explain fast radio bursts is an extremely uh, relevant uh, current field of study. Um, of course, there are many millisecond pulsars that have been observed in clusters for the past several decades. Um, explaining how these objects form um, is also another uh, very interesting um, topic under this, this theme. Um, and then other, uh, other potential applications as well, such as the tidal disruption events of stars by stellar mass black holes and other compact objects in these clusters is also something I've thought a lot about recently. Um, okay, so first, I want to just give a very basic overview of what I'm what I mean by a star cluster, um, specifically relevant to the the types of clusters I'll be talking about in this in this talk. So um, I'm specifically focusing on uh, clusters similar to the globular clusters that are now very well observed in the Milky Way. So these are old populations of stars, uh, generally ten billion years at least. Uh, because they're old, this means they were formed long ago in the universe, uh, which means they're generally associated with low metallicity stellar populations. Uh, so a good sort of rough number to keep in mind is 10% of solar metallicity or lower. Um, as I'll talk about a bit later, um, the low metallicity um, feature of these systems uh, plays a key role in the mass uh, spectrum of the black holes that we expect to form in these, in these clusters. Um, globular clusters generally have uh, roughly 100,000 to a million stars. Of course, this can vary, but this is sort of the, the mean of the typical distribution, at least based on the Milky Way clusters that we observe. And then these are very compact systems. So the typical half light radius is of order of parsec. And of course, it's this combination of many stars compressed into a very small uh, region of space that makes these very dense, very dynamically active environments. Uh, so as I hinted at before, there's roughly 150 globular clusters observed in the Milky Way. So if we look at this uh, schematic on the right um, side of this, of this slide, uh, we see the distribution of clusters that we observe in the Milky Way. So um, roughly half of these clusters are uh, distributed uh, roughly spherically within the halo of our galaxy, and the rest are found within the disk. Um, and over the past uh, couple decades, we've now realized that um, in addition to the globular clusters in the Milky Way, there are also globular clusters in essentially all types of galaxies. Um, so in spiral galaxies like the Milky Way and also Andromeda, um, we expect of order 100 to a few hundred of these globular clusters. Um, in large elliptical galaxies like M87, for instance, in the Virgo cluster, um, there are tens of thousands of globular clusters observed. And then also in the past uh, few years in particular, there's a lot of evidence that even the lowest mass galaxies, ultra diffuse dwarf galaxies, um, also contain globular clusters. So the lowest mass galaxies in particular are interesting because in these galaxies, a lot of um, recent observations show that a significant fraction of all of the stars in the galaxy are actually contained within these globular clusters. So for this particular galaxy I'm highlighting here, which has roughly 50 globular clusters, um, of order 10% of all the stars are actually found in the globular clusters, um, as opposed to less than 1% of the stars in the Milky Way. So these are very ubiquitous systems amongst all galaxy types in the universe. And then motivating this topic further, there's now a lot of both observational and theoretical evidence that the majority of stars are born in stellar clusters or stellar associations. So this is a little summary plot um, from a paper from a few years ago showing um, for a few different galaxies in the local universe, uh, the fraction of stars observed in bound clusters uh, versus star formation rate of the galaxy. Um, and the different colors here are simply showing the ages of the clusters in which these stars are observed. So the key point is for um, galaxies which have the highest star formation rates, um, they also have the youngest clusters generally, um, and a significant fraction of order 50% of stars are actually observed in bound clusters in these systems. So although most of these clusters are not going to survive all the way to the present day to become old globular clusters like the ones we observe in the Milky Way, the fact that a significant fraction of stars are born within these dense stellar clusters suggests that the dynamical processes relevant in the Milky Way globular clusters may be playing a significant role in the evolution of uh, the vast majority of stars at some point in their lifetimes. 
So this motivates us to study in detail these dynamical processes and ways that they can influence uh, both stellar and binary evolution and also ultimately the evolution of the compact objects that are formed. So in the Milky Way globular clusters specifically, which are obviously nearby, we can observe uh, many individual stellar sources. There are, are now a very wide variety of so-called exotic stellar sources, specifically related to compact objects that have been observed. So this includes both X-ray binaries, which presumably um, are a star accreting onto either a neutron star or black hole binary companion. Uh, blue stragglers, which are expected to be formed through collisions or mergers of main sequence stars. Uh, millisecond pulsars and cataclysmic variables accreting white dwarfs. Um, and then um, also, again, as I mentioned earlier, what I think is potentially the most exciting of these compact object sources um, is the formation of compact object binaries that eventually merge and potentially um, produce gravitational wave emission similar to that observed by LIGO Virgo over the past few years. So um, it's now very well understood that not only are these types of sources forming dynamically in clusters, um, but again, based on observations of the Milky Way clusters, these sources are forming at rates much higher than they would be forming um, through just standard single star or standard or binary star evolution. This is a direct result of the dynamical uh, processes relevant in a dense system like a globular cluster. So in addition to um, the dynamics producing these sort of interesting and exotic stellar sources related to compact objects, the compact objects also play a key role in the evolution of their host clusters themselves. And this is um, a key topic that I've worked on over the past few years. And the general consensus that's been um, arrived at through both the work that I've done and also many others um, is showing that the black holes especially, um, in addition to the white dwarfs and neutron stars, when present in clusters in large numbers can actually play a large dynamical role um, through the dynamics of these individual compact objects on the evolution of their host cluster. And as a result of this sort of connected nature between the compact objects and the host clusters that they live in, allows us to use observations of these various host cluster features to constrain indirectly the compact object populations themselves, which I'll talk a bit about in a few slides. Um, so I just want to spend a couple minutes going over the computational methods that um, myself and our group uh, use to model star clusters. Um, so the most straightforward way to potentially model a star cluster is using a so-called direct n-body integrator. So certainly these integrators um, exist and many people use them uh, with large amounts of success, but the major downside is they are computationally very expensive. And um, I would argue that there is yet to be a full scale direct n-body simulation of a realistic size globular cluster uh, ever performed. So the best way to perform um, realistic size globular cluster simulation is to use more approximate methods. So we use uh, the so-called Monte Carlo technique that dates back uh, several decades, back to the 70s. Um, and the basic idea here is that you use this Monte Carlo method to sample the orbits of stars and the galactic potential in a way that simulates the cumulative effect of the many uh, weak distant encounters that are taking place within a star cluster. So essentially you're using this statistical method to model uh, the many weak encounters that are very abundant, but don't play a significant role in the evolution of uh, the, in changing the orbits of individual stars um, on a short time scale. So critically though, there are um, during the course of the evolution of the cluster, frequent so-called strong encounters where the orbits of stars can be perturbed significantly by the or uh, by the interactions with single st stars or single binaries in the cluster. So although the distant weak encounters are um, approached in this cumulative statistical Monte Carlo sense, for these strong resident encounters, we perform direct in-body integrations of these three or four body encounters, uh, which allows us to um, uh, constrain in detail a lot of the processes that are relevant for the formation of black hole binaries, especially, um, and ultimately potentially the formation of black hole binary mergers. So um, a critical aspect of this code is um, embedded within it. We have uh, implemented a, a stellar and binary star 
evolutionary model. Uh, so this is based on the cosmic population uh, synthesis code, which in turn is based on uh, the BSC SSC codes that were developed about 20 years ago by Jared Hurley and Chris Tout at Cambridge. Um, so critically, this stellar evolution code allows us to um, study, at least at a basic level, the um, evolution of stars and the formation of the compact objects that we expect are going to be formed. So all in all, this code um, allows us to simulate the evolution of realistic size star clusters, so containing of order a million stars or even more, um, including all the relevant physics pertaining especially to the compact objects that we expect are forming. Um, and we're able to simulate these clusters over the full evolutionary lifetime, so roughly 12 billion years of evolution. Um, this allows us to build catalogs of models uh, that effectively capture the full range of globular cluster properties that are observed both in the Milky Way and also in other galaxies. So um, a, key, uh, a key point, especially that's um, enabled by the implementation of the stellar evolution code within our, um, within our cluster models, is that we're able to, um, in essence, observe our cluster models in the same way that they would be observed um, by, uh, for realistic clusters in the Milky Way. So this allows us to build large catalogs of models and then use various observational features such as the core and half-light radii of the clusters, the surface brightness and velocity dispersion profiles, and also uh, measurements of various um, individual objects like X-ray binaries, pulsars, et cetera, um, to constrain our models and to compare them to observations and ultimately to make statements concerning, for example, what is the underlying population of black holes that a particular observed cluster might actually contain. So this is a typical, uh, the typical approach generally used by our models um, and the way that our models are used um, to compare to observations and to make predictions. Um, so as I mentioned briefly um, a, a couple minutes ago, um, over the past couple of years, we've developed a large catalog of roughly um, a few hundred um, full-scale n-body models of globular clusters that are tuned specifically to match the globular clusters that are observed in the Milky Way. So this is the first full um, self-consistent study that is able to produce um, in particular, both core collapsed and non-core collapsed clusters, um, which I'll talk about a bit later, but um, this distinction between the core collapsed and non-core collapsed clusters um, is a key feature of the Milky Way clusters that are observed. And as I'll talk about a bit, um, they actually play a key role in hinting at the underlying populations of black holes that we expect are living in these clusters at present day. So this is the main catalog of models um, that most of the results throughout the rest of the talk are going to be coming from. Um, so just something to keep in mind as you think about the, uh, the types of models that I'm drawing from and the types of clusters that the models are representing. Any questions yet? So this is sort of the setup and everything from here out is going to be more results oriented. So if people have questions now about the, the basic approach, now is a good time to ask. If not, I will press on. So the next thing I wanna do is uh, give a basic summary of our current understanding of compact object populations and clusters, particularly related to the black holes. So for a typical cluster uh, with roughly a million stars at birth and a typical initial mass function, for example, drawn from the Krupa 2001 distribution, this is very commonly used in the field. Uh, we expect to form roughly 1,000 stellar mass black holes. So generally a good rule of thumb is for every thousand stars, you can expect to form roughly one stellar mass black hole. So these black holes form very early on within the evolution of the cluster within the first few to tens of millions of years. And once the black holes form, they very quickly mass segregate into the center of the cluster. So this is a natural consequence of dynamical friction, which is expected to operate in any dense stellar environment like a globular cluster. So the typical time scale for this mass segregation is roughly 100 million years or less. So on this time scale, you will form a very compact subcluster in the center dominated specifically by these stellar mass black holes. 
on slightly uh, longer time scales, um, roughly 30 to 100 million years, the next most massive stellar population will uh, evolve and collapse into neutron stars. So for neutron stars specifically, um, based on observations of uh, pulsars in our own Milky Way, um, it's generally well understood that the majority of neutron stars formed through core collapse supernova receives large uh, natal kicks at birth. Now the escape velocity of a typical globular cluster is of order 100 kilometers per second. And based on these pulsar distributions, we know that many neutron stars receive natal kicks much larger than this. So we actually expect that the majority of neutron stars formed at early times in clusters uh, through core collapse supernova actually get ejected right away. Um, in this case, the majority of the neutron stars that formed um, get ejected and, and it's a very small fraction that we actually have retained and potentially surviving in the cluster all the way to the present day. And then of course, on uh, longer term time scales, um, the lowest mass stars will collapse and form white dwarfs. So for a typical cluster, again, with roughly a million stars, by the present day age, you can expect um, in excess of 10,000 white dwarfs. So the vast majority of the stars are gonna end up uh, creating white dwarfs in the cluster. So this basic picture, this basic cartoon that we're left with at the, at the, at the moment here on the bottom of the slide is what the cluster is gonna look like for the majority of its life. You have a very dense subsystem of black holes in the center and then you have the lower mass stars as well as neutron stars and white dwarfs mixed in the outer parts of the cluster in the halo uh, where they're living in the less dynamically active regions. So within this compact black hole subcluster, uh, the black holes are going to interact with one another on very short time scales. And as a result of these black hole dynamical encounters, the black holes are expected to uh, gradually eject one another from the cluster. So in this case, we expect over the remainder of the lifetime of the cluster, the black hole population will slowly decrease until eventually the full population ends up being ejected. This is the inevitable fate of all clusters. If given enough time, the black hole population will be depleted entirely. So for a long time, um, going back to the, to the 80s and 90s, it was expected that these black hole dynamical processes would be so efficient that all of the black holes would be ejected from the clusters by the time they reached their present day ages of roughly 12 billion years for the Milky Way clusters. Uh, but more recently, um, there's been a number of modern, more modern end-body simulations as well as a number of observations that, is, that have suggested that in fact, the majority of clusters actually still retain a large number of black holes by the time they reach their present day ages. So um, to address this first point, this is um, one of the first um, full n-body, full-scale n-body models of clusters that actually included large populations of stellar mass black holes. Um, so these different panels here are showing uh, different numbers of stars we're assuming in the cluster at birth. And the key point that I wanna emphasize is that again, you can see um, at very early times, roughly a hundred to a few thousand black holes form. Uh, through stellar evolution. And then once the black holes form slowly throughout the remainder of the evolution of the cluster, the number of black holes slowly decreases as, as a result of these black hole dynamical processes I was mentioning before. But the key point is that if we look at the present day ages of these clusters, 10 billion years or more, uh, very naturally you can retain, these models predict you can retain hundreds to even thousands of black holes at present. So on the observational side, there now is a lot of observational evidence that most star or that some star clusters, at least in the Milky Way, um, retain individual black holes at present day. So these black holes have been observationally identified through two primary methods. Um, the first is through um, a combination of X-ray and radio observations. The basic idea here is that by the relative value of the X-ray to radio luminosity, uh, you can infer that the accretor in these systems is a black hole as opposed to a neutron star. And then the second method, which um, personally I think is a more reliable and robust method of identifying black holes and clusters, um, came about about four years ago now. Um, and the idea here is through radio velocity measurements of uh, main sequence companions to the black holes and binaries, you can infer the presence of a black hole binary companion 
um, and then through the radial velocity uh, measurements and for the mass of the black hole in these systems. So there now have been three um, tentatively confirmed black holes um, identified through the radial velocity measurements. All three of these are found in one single cluster in the Milky Way, NGC 3201, which I'll talk about a bit, a bit later. Uh, but there are a number of candidate uh, black holes, um, again, measured through radial velocity observations in a number of additional Milky Way clusters. Um, so very much in the coming uh, years, in the coming decade, I think there's going to be a large number of these radial velocity measurements that are uncovering additional black holes in a number of additional globular clusters in the Milky Way. Kyle, there is a question. Arindo, yes. go ahead and ask. Yeah. Hello, am I audible? Yep. Yeah. So in the previous slides, uh, what are those colors, different colors signifies? Yes, uh, the colors here are different assumptions about the a few different cluster parameters. So I think a few different assumptions about the metallicity um, and a few different assumptions about the initial concentration of the clusters. Um, so certainly the different panels are showing the sort of simplest thing, which is simply the number of stars. Um, and then within a cluster of a given number of stars, there's a number of additional theoretical parameters that can basically tweak slightly the evolution of, um, of the black hole population. So I'll talk about this actually a little bit more detail on a on a couple later slides and, and go into some more specifics. Thanks for the question. So um, keeping in mind and looking a little, a little bit further at this particular cluster, NGC 3201, which again is this cluster which has three observed black hole, um, stellar mass black hole candidates. Um, this idea that you know, some clusters can potentially retain large numbers of black holes at present day um, is further motivated by looking at sort of the effect of the black holes on the structure of their host cluster. Uh, so this plot here is showing in blue and black curves um, a large number of n-body models which basically retain many black holes at present day. So these are the black curves. Uh, versus very few black holes at the present day. So these are the blue curves. And this is showing basically the surface brightness profile of these clusters. And the surface brightness profile essentially, um, uh, at least qualitatively, is a measure of the density profile of the cluster. So obviously towards the center, the clusters are more dense and they're brighter. You can also tell this when you look at a typical image of a cluster that you might look at. Um, and then as you go out to the edges of the cluster, uh, there are fewer stars, the clusters dim in brightness. Um, and the clear uh, message that we uh, conveyed in this, initial, um, in, the, in this initial result, which was publishing the first n-body models of this particular cluster, NGC 3201, is that models which have um, very large populations of black holes are clearly the most consistent with the observed surface brightness profile uh, for this particular cluster. So this is what I'm showing in these yellow circles here, the observed surface brightness profile for 3201. On the other hand, the models with very few black holes, these blue models have this very prominent cusp in the inner regions of the brightness profile, which is indicative of what we would call a core collapse cluster. So this connection between black holes um, and the cluster, uh, the, the structure of the cluster core um, actually connects with a very deep um, mystery that's been around in the field of cluster dynamics for a long time. So I'm gonna talk about this a bit next. So um, as, as self-gravitating systems, um, the inevitable fate of a globular cluster is to evolve towards a core collapse configuration. Uh, the basic idea is energy flows uh, between the halo and the core of the cluster in such a way that the core contracts while the halo expands. So we expect that if given enough time, and indeed the Milky Way clusters that we observe at present day are in excess of 10 billion years old, they will evolve toward core collapse. Um, but surprisingly, the vast majority of the clusters that we observe in the Milky Way are not core collapse at present day. Roughly only one out of five of the clusters that we observe actually has undergone core collapse. And this is somewhat of a, um, somewhat of a mystery because based on the observed properties of these systems, based on the relaxation times we, had, we observe, 
we would expect actually that most of the clusters should have undergone core collapse. So this suggests that there's some sort of um, internal energy mechanism that's effectively um, transferring energy to the stars and delaying their tendency to collapse into the cores of these clusters. And as I'll talk about next, um, the current understanding or the current belief is that uh, populations of stellar mass black holes may very naturally explain what this internal energy mechanism is that's delaying the onset of core collapse in the majority of clusters that we observe. So the basic idea behind how this works, as I mentioned before on the previous slides, once the black holes form, they mass segregate to the center of the cluster and they undergo, they begin to undergo dynamical encounters with one another at very high rates. Once these black holes begin to interact, they form binaries and they create a large amount of energy as the black hole binaries uh, become more compact through additional encounters. These black hole binaries and the black holes then basically transfer energy into the stellar bulk of the cluster as they undergo interactions with the stars dynamically. And the cumulative effect is for these black hole dynamical processes to essentially transfer energy out into the stars in the cluster. As a result, when you have a large population of black holes, especially at early times, the black holes heat the cluster and they produce a very uh, relatively large core in the cluster. So if you look at the plot on the, the right here, I'm showing sort of a cartoon illustration of the surface brightness profiles. And we can see in this particular case, you have this very flat component in the inner region, which is indicative of a, of a very large uh, core for the cluster. Now, as I mentioned before, um, as a result of these black hole dynamical processes, the number of black holes is going to slowly decrease in the cluster. And as the number of black holes decreases, the energy created through these internal black hole dynamics also decreases. As a result, the black holes slowly become less efficient at heating the host cluster. And as a result of this, we can see that as the number of black holes decreases, the surface brightness of the Cluster, uh, profile of the cluster becomes increasingly centrally concentrated until eventually, as we can see here, once nearly all of the black holes have been ejected, you have this very prominent cusp in the inner regions of the, of the surface brightness profile, which is indicative of what we would call a core collapse cluster. So I'll just go through this quickly one more time. When you have many clusters at early times, they heat the cluster significantly, produce a very large core in the cluster. And as the, as the number of black holes decreases, the core slowly contracts until eventually, once all the black holes have been ejected, the cluster is able to undergo core collapse. So the next natural question is, what then determines whether or not a, a cluster has ejected all of its black holes by the time it reaches its present day age of roughly 12 billion years? So uh, the basic idea that we expect is that the key uh, determining factor which sets the rate at which black holes are ejected and therefore the number of black holes that are retained by the end of the evolution of the cluster or by the present day age is simply the initial density of the cluster. So the initial density of the cluster essentially sets the dynamical clock. This sets how quickly the cluster is going to evolve dynamically or as I said before, how quickly the cluster is going to evolve toward core collapse. The most dense clusters are going to evolve the most uh, quickly and will tend to reach core collapse the quickest. Um, so this uh, pair of plots here on the left, I'm showing uh, again, as I showed before, simply the number of black holes uh, retained in the cluster versus time. So these are for three cluster models with the same number of stars. The only thing that I'm varying here is the initial virial radius of the cluster. So this is essentially the characteristic size of the cluster at birth. And obviously the more compact the initial virial radius, the denser the cluster at birth and the more quickly it will evolve. So as you can see uh, in the cluster, which we start um, with the initially most compact size shown as a blue curve here, this cluster processes through its black holes most quickly and the black holes are ejected the most quickly. As a result, when you look at the right-hand panel, which is showing the surface brightness profile at the present day age of these three particular models, we can see again, this blue curve model, which has ejected all of its black holes, is the only of the three to reach a core collapse configuration at present day. And on the other hand, this orange curve model, which has the relatively largest radius at birth, 
still is able to retain a large fraction of its black holes at present day. Um, and as a result, as a result of the dynamical activity and this dynamical heating associated with this large population of black holes, uh, this orange curve model on the right, we still see very clearly has a very large core at present day. It clearly has not yet undergone core collapse. So uh, this distribution and in initial cluster radii that we choose here is motivated by observations of young stellar clusters in the local universe, um, and also motivated by cosmological simulations that predict characteristic sizes of globular clusters at birth. And the basic idea is that within this uh, relatively narrow range in initial virial radii, so uh, roughly just a single order of magnitude from half a parsec up to about five parsecs. We can very naturally produce the observed um, range in globular cluster types that are observed in the Milky Way, uh, ranging from both the most compact core collapse clusters all the way to the most, um, the least dense, most diffuse uh, non-core collapse clusters that we observe. And as I was showing here, the black hole populations specifically are the essential ingredient in determining whether or not some clusters have undergone core collapse or not by their present day ages. Um, so one more, plight, one more plot here to sort of hopefully drive this point home a little bit further. Uh, this plot here is looking at three specific clusters in the Milky Way, NGC 30201, M22, and NGC 6752. These three clusters all have roughly similar total mass, but very different core radii. So 3201 has um, one of the largest core radii of clusters of this mass in the Milky Way. And on the other hand, NGC 6752 is a core collapse cluster. It's a very compact core, as we can see from the surface brightness profile. So the, the, on the, the background of these different panels here, I'm showing again, um, a number of different n-body models, which have different numbers of black holes retained at present day. And the key feature, as you can see here, the clusters that are observed to have the largest core radii, in this case, NGC 30201, are most well uh, matched by the n-body models that have the largest populations of black holes at present day. And on the other hand, as the core radius of the observed clusters decreases, moving all the way to the right to NGC 6752, which is core collapsed, this cluster is most accurately matched by models that have ejected all of their black holes by present day, um, and I've undergone core collapse um, at, at present. So these are these blue curve models on the right. So we expect the prediction here of these models is that the larger the core radius of the cluster, the more black holes that it retains at present day, assuming a fixed cluster mass. So um, current predictions um, from uh, papers um, from, from our group, which uh, Shorov has also played a, a key role in over the past couple of years, uh, predict that um, the uh, Milky of the Milky Way globular clusters, uh, roughly 70% of these clusters contain at least 20 stellar mass black holes at present day. And many of these clusters contain many more, uh, potentially even hundreds of these black holes. So we expect that the presence of these black hole populations in clusters, even at the present day, is actually very common um, to at least the Milky Way globular clusters. Um, and then another key point is that the models, which um, as I was showing before, can very effectively match the observed range and surface brightness profiles for the, um, the globular clusters that are observed, also very naturally produce uh, the black hole plus star binaries that have been observed in particularly NGC 3201 through radial velocity measurements. Uh, so this plot here is showing on the top um, the mass of the main sequence companion and on the bottom the eccentricity versus the same major axis for all of the black hole plus star binaries that are formed in this large set of n-body models that I've been discussing. And then this X here is um, the observed um, properties for the first of these black hole binary um, black hole binaries that were actually observed in NGC 30201. So the prediction from the models is that nearly all clusters, both in the Milky Way and also um, in other galaxies, should contain of order a few, so maybe one to three, uh, black hole plus star binaries at the present day. So this further motivates, um, again, 
the search for additional black hole candidates in Milky Way clusters beyond just NGC 3201, which at present is the only cluster to have uh, bona fide observed black holes um, at present day. So just a few um, sort of summary points before I transition to the second part of the talk on gravitational waves. Um, observations of Milky Way globular clusters show that the majority of clusters have not yet undergone core collapse. Um, despite the fact that we would have expected naively that most clusters should have undergone core collapse by present day. It appears that stellar mass black holes may very well provide the energy source um, capable of delaying the onset of core collapse in the majority of these clusters as we observe. And as I mentioned also, several galactic and also extra galactic globular clusters have observed black hole candidates as members of individual binaries and also have structural features such as their core radius that hint at much larger underlying black hole populations. We expect that the, the retention of large black hole populations is actually a common feature of the majority of globular clusters at present day. Now, what I think is the most exciting application of this topic, of uh, this idea that most globular clusters have large populations of black holes throughout their lifetimes, is the natural application to the formation of merging black hole binaries, which potentially can be observed as gravitational wave sources similar to those that have been detected uh, by the LIGO-Virgo collaboration over the past roughly five years. So this is the next part of the talk is discussing how you form black hole binaries and end up merging them within these clusters. So this is another good point to pause and ask if people have questions about some of the stuff I've discussed so far. Any questions? If not, I will press on again. Uh, so um, over the past roughly five years, this is sort of the, the famous plot from LIGO showing all of the black hole binary mergers that have been detected so far. Um, at present, we have of order 100 uh, separate merger events, which is pretty astounding given the first one came only about five years ago. Um, and even though there's been a very, um, a very quickly growing population of these uh, black hole binary mergers that have been observed, the details of their formation mechanisms um, are very much still an open question in the field. So there have been a number of formation mechanisms that have been proposed. Uh, sort of the classic uh, canonical formation mechanism is the formation of black hole binaries through individual binary star evolution. So this is expected to um, rely on common envelope processes and other binary evolution processes. Uh, but more recently, there have been alternative formation mechanisms proposed, in particular uh, relating to dynamical processes. So this is um, relevant in the context of globular clusters, as, as I'm going to be focusing on here, and also other types of clusters like younger massive clusters, open clusters, nuclear clusters. Um, and then, of course, in addition to these sort of um, two primary channels, there have been another, a number of additional formation mechanisms that have been proposed for how these black hole binaries may have formed. Um, primordial binaries, uh, lead off Kozai oscillation and triples, AGN disks, many different scenarios. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna focus primarily on this globular cluster mechanism. Um, so first I wanna just sort of zoom into this black hole subcluster that I was showing on previous slides. And I want to quickly go through the key dynamical processes that are happening within these black hole subclusters that ultimately lead to the formation of black hole binaries and eventually black hole binary mergers. So the first key process is the formation of black hole binaries through three body encounters. In any sufficiently dense environment, you will occasionally have um, a, a group of three black holes come close enough for a pair of the black holes to become bound at the expense of the other. The characteristic time scale to form binaries through this mechanism in a typical globular cluster is of order 100 million years. So again, for a typical cluster, which lives for 12 billion years or more, there's plenty of time for black hole binaries to form through three body encounters. So once the first black hole binary forms, it will inevitably undergo additional encounters with other black holes in the cluster, 
So this can take the form of both uh, binary single encounters, as I'm showing in this animation here, and also binary binary encounters where pairs of binary black holes encounter one another. Now, the consequence of these many black hole binary encounters is that for these initially dynamically hard binaries to become harder, to become more compact as they undergo encounters. So this is a well-known result in cluster dynamics that goes back to work by Douglas, uh, Douglas Heggie in the 1970s. And the result is that once the black hole binaries form, they undergo many additional encounters on timescales ranging from uh, less than a million year to again, a, a hundred or a few hundred million years. And as a result of these many dynamical encounters, the black holes will slowly um, shrink. It will slowly become more compact. Now, a key result is that um, the typical recoil velocity associated with the dynamics of these encounters scales roughly as the orbital velocity of these binaries. So this means that as the binaries become more compact, as the certain major axis A shrinks, they become, uh, they reach higher orbital velocities and therefore attain higher gravitational recoil velocities. As a result, as these binaries harden, they are slowly um, flung out onto increasingly wider orbits within their host cluster, as I'm showing on the bottom left here. So inevitably, once the black hole has undergone enough encounters and hardened sufficiently, it will actually be ejected from its host cluster entirely. This is what the reason why we expect the number of black holes in the cluster to slowly decrease throughout the evolution of the cluster. And then of course, the key, um, the key to forming a merger is that as the binary becomes more compact, eventually its gravitational wave in spiral time becomes sufficiently so short for the binary to merge um, and potentially be observable as a gravitational wave source if it's close enough in the local universe. So these are the basic processes that, that govern the formation of black hole binaries and eventually black hole binary mergers within star clusters. So um, with these three processes in hand, there are three main formation mechanisms through which black hole binary mergers occur. So uh, the first of the three is this ejection mechanism. So related to what I said before, black hole binaries are increasingly flung out onto wider orbits as a result of these dynamical encounters within the black hole subcluster. Um, for a fraction of these binaries, when they are ejected, they will have gravitational wave in spiral time sufficiently short to cause the binary to merge in the local universe. So uh, this ejection channel accounts for roughly half of the binary black hole mergers we expect in a typical star cluster. Um, on the other hand, uh, for channel number two, as a result of these dynamical encounters, the black hole binaries um, attain very large eccentricities. And for sufficiently high eccentricities, in fact, for any eccentricity, the gravitational wave in spiral time um, uh, decreases sharply as the eccentricity increases. So as a result, occasionally within the cluster as the black hole binaries undergo these dynamical encounters, they can attain a sufficiently high eccentricity to have a sufficiently short gravitational wave in spiral time to actually merge within their host cluster themselves before they can undergo enough encounters to be ejected from their host. So this um, in-cluster channel accounts for roughly 40% of the mergers we expect in a typical cluster. And critically, these mergers, unlike the ejected channel, are generally going to have high eccentricities when, when, they, when they merge within their host cluster. And the final um, channel that I'm gonna talk about, which accounts for a small subset, roughly 10% of all the mergers, is this so-called gravitational wave capture uh, mechanism. So in this case, during the gravitational wave resonant encounters, um, during the resonant encounters themselves between these groups of black holes, you have a pair of black holes come close enough to actually become bound through the emission of gravitational waves. You form a binary through um, capture process. So these binaries also will be merging inside their host cluster. Um, and these are expected to be the most highly eccentric of the group. Uh, the idea is that when you form a black hole binary through uh, gravitational wave capture, 
the binary at formation has a very high eccentricity, roughly an eccentricity of one. So when they merge, even entering the LIGO band, they're expected to have still a very large eccentricity, which potentially if observed, um, and if inferred from the LIGO data would hint strongly at this, at this type of dynamical process. So these are the, three, the main three mechanisms through which we expect black hole binaries to form. And um, a key result is that, again, using this sort of large catalog of n-body models that I was showing on previous slides, again, critically, I want to point out that these models very effectively match a large number of observational features of the Milky Way globular clusters as a whole. Looking at these black hole processes that we expect are happening in these clusters, we can predict the volumetric merger rate of binary black holes coming from clusters in the local universe and ultimately compare the rate from the models to the inferred rate from the LIGO observations to date. So this is what I'm showing in this plot here. So in blue, I'm showing the observation, um, I'm showing the inferred merger rate from the LIGO observations to date uh, with uncertainty bands shown in different shades of blue. And then in black here in the various um, uh, black curves, I'm showing the rate that is inferred from our globular cluster models for, again, a few different values for this initial burial radius. So you probably remember on the previous slide, the initial burial radius is the key property that determines how quickly the black holes are ejected from their host cluster. Um, also, this determines essentially how dynamically active the black holes are throughout the evolutionary lifetime. And we can see for, again, this typical range in virial radii, which again, before I showed, very effectively allows us to match the observed properties of globular clusters in the local universe, uh, very cleanly brackets the observed um, inferred rate from the LIGO observations to date. So this implies, at least from a rates perspective, that black hole dynamics operating in globular cluster type systems very naturally may account for um, potentially all of the binary black hole mergers that have been observed so far with LIGO. Um, but of course, there are other properties aside from the rates alone that can be used to uh, hint at the formation mechanisms for, these, for these, um, these gravitational wave sources that have been observed by LIGO. So I'm gonna mention one specific example. I think this will probably be the last thing I talk about, uh, which is the masses of these black holes. And I want to mention in particular, I want to zoom in on this sort of these most massive black holes that have been observed by LIGO, which have presented a somewhat of a, um, of a mystery for, for people in the community because these black holes have masses where we previously thought black holes should not be existing. Um, so these massive black holes with masses of 50 to 100 solar masses reside in what we know as, and what we generally refer to as the upper black hole mass gap. And uh, theoretical models of stellar evolution and black hole formation through the evolution of individual massive stars predict that you should have a black hole, a gap in the black hole mass function from roughly um, 50 to 100 solar masses as a result of the parent stability process. So this plot here is showing uh, basically a simple schematic of, of how this parent stability process is operating. So on the vertical axis here, I'm showing the black hole mass versus on the um, horizontal axis, the zero, the zero age main sequence mass uh, for a range of initial stellar masses. And the key point here is that, again, you can see uh, this gap from roughly, um, from from ZAM's masses of roughly 150 up to um, in excess of 200 solar masses, that results in a gap in the black hole mass function from roughly 50 to 100, a little over 100 solar masses. The basic idea here is that for sufficiently massive stars, the core gets sufficiently hot to undergo uh, essentially a runaway um, as a result of uh, the annihilation of uh, um, of a uh, uh, um, pulsational of, of uh, pairs of, uh, sorry, it's 11 p.m. and I'm getting a little sleepy. <laughs> uh, uh, the result of um, a, a positron, um, <laughs> I'm forgetting the name of the subatomic particle, um, uh, pairs of particles that annihilate and essentially lead to pulsations of of, um, uh, in the star uh, that uh, result in the, a lot, um, the um, loss of mass in the stellar envelope 
that end up depleting the core of the star and leading to either a, a, pair, a series of pulsations that basically grind down the core of the star um, or a complete detonation of the star, which ends up uh, leaving a gap in the black hole mass function. Um, so the key results on the gravitational wave side over the past few years, the sort of um, key event that we've detected is GW190521. Um, and this event has um, uh, at least one, potentially even both components lying right in the middle of this parent stability mass gap that we expected um, based on previous models. So in addition to this sort of um, initial event, 190521, there's been a number of additional events by LIGO with uh, mass is potentially residing in this parent stability mass gap. And this suggests that there must be some mechanism operating that allows formation of black holes that um, reside in this mass gap. So one very natural mechanism that would exist specifically in dense stellar clusters um, is the ability for black holes to merge repeatedly. So the basic idea here is you can have an initial pair of black holes, which are formed through simply a pair of single stars that form a binary and merge, uh, producing roughly an 80 solar mass black hole. And again, because you're in a dense environment, if that initial black hole merger can be retained, this black hole can potentially find another companion and merge again within the dynamical environment. So even though you're not actually producing black holes um, through stellar evolution, in the mass gap through series of successive black hole mergers, you're able to produce more massive black holes than you would have otherwise. Um, and if you can merge these black holes again, you could potentially produce mergers with one or even potentially both components residing in the parent stability mass gap. Now the key process here um, is whether or not the black hole merger products can be retained. And it's well known that mergers of black holes, the merger products of black holes receive large uh, kicks associated with the anisotropic emission of gravitational waves during the merger process. Uh, these kicks can easily be in excess of a few hundred or even in excess of a thousand kilometers per second, which is more than sufficient to eject them from a typical globular cluster, which has an escape velocity of maybe 100 kilometers per second. The key factor that determines uh, the magnitude of these gravitational wave kicks is the spins of the black holes at merger. So this plot on the right here is showing the fraction of mergers um, that have at least one component in this mass gap uh, versus the dimensionless birth spin assumed for the black holes. And the key is that if you assume um, the black holes are born with small spins at birth, then they will receive relatively uh, small gravitational wave uh, kicks, which allows them to be retained and potentially merge again in their host cluster. As the initial spin of the black holes increases, then eventually most of the black holes get kicked out um, at, after the first merger and it becomes increasingly difficult to merge again um, produce and produce these second generation mergers. So uh, the main result I wanna emphasize is if the majority of black holes are born with small spins, which is, a fairly motivated result based on current stellar evolution models, then we expect roughly 10% of the black hole binary mergers expected in globular clusters should have at least one component in the upper mass gap. And this prediction from the n-body models is also consistent with um, the predictions shown by the LIGO observations to date. From the LIGO observations, again, roughly 10% of the black holes have a mass gap component. Um, so I'm running out of time. I think I'm going to go ahead and skip ahead to my conclusions. Sorry for skipping ahead here. Um, uh, but I will go ahead and leave my conclusions slide up here. And um, the main conclusions are, again, uh, there's a wide variety of observational and theoretical evidence that stellar mass black holes are formed and retained in globular clusters throughout their entire lifetimes. Um, these black holes influence the evolution of their host clusters um, as a result of the dynamical interaction between the black holes themselves and also stars in their host cluster. And very naturally, as a result of these black hole populations and clusters, you uh, inevitably produce black hole binaries and ultimately black hole binary mergers in these clusters, which may potentially account for a significant fraction of the LIGO Virgo gravitational wave events that have been detected. There are of course many other topics under this umbrella, this theme of compact objects and clusters that I don't have time to talk about today. Um, 
Uh, I certainly would encourage anybody, if you're interested, though, to send me an email and I'd be happy to chat further. Um, in particular, taking advantage of this large database of cluster models that we've um, developed over the past couple of years that very effectively matches uh, the clusters observed both in the Milky Way and also elsewhere in the local universe. So thanks again for uh, attending the talk. Um, happy to answer some questions if people have any. Okay, let's thank Carl. Uh, so personally, uh, Carl, can you briefly show the other method of creating mass gap black holes? And sure the final radial distribution of different compact objects. So I, I saw that you have these slides, so maybe you can just. Yeah, I'll, I'll go through it really quickly. So as I, was, as I did explain, the first method to form black holes is through repeated black hole mergers. Another method to form massive black holes and clusters is through stellar mergers. So very early on within the evolution of, the, of, of a globular cluster, before the stars have collapsed into black holes, we expect you can have occasional collisions or mergers of massive um, stars. So in particular, if you can have a merger similar to the one I'm sort of showing in this, um, in this schematic here, uh, where you have um, a giant with a core mass below the parent stability threshold, so below roughly 40 solar masses. If such a giant can collide with a main sequence star of 30 or 40 solar masses, then the expectation is that um, the main sequence star will mix with the envelope of the giant in such a way that you form um, a, a giant with a core below the parent stability threshold, but with an oversized hydrogen envelope as a result of this mixing with this collision partner. So the result is then if the subsequent evolution of this collision product um, does not enable the core to grow significantly, then the, because the core is sufficiently low mass, this star will avoid the parent stability. But because of this overmassive hydrogen envelope, when this star collapses into a black hole, um, it, will able, it will be able to form um, a black hole in the parent stability mass gap because of the collapse of this excess of material in the envelope of the star. So um, one point that I wanted to mention briefly, there's uh, a pair of papers that came out um, about a month or two ago that actually um, modeled this basic process that I just outlined in words um, using um, both hydrodynamic models and also MESA stellar evolution models of the um, remnants of these collisions, of these massive star collisions. Um, and these two papers basically um, confirmed um, quantitatively the basic qualitative description that I just walked through. And then just to sort of um, explain a bit further, of course, you could have additional collisions happening within the, the cluster at very early times. If you have additional collisions before the collision products collapse the black holes, you could potentially undergo parent stability supernova, or if you have runaway series of collisions, you could eventually form very massive stars that might ultimately collapse into what we would call intermediate mass black holes. So black holes of a hundred or a few hundred solar masses or even up to thousands of solar masses, depending on the nature of the collisional runaway. So this basic idea of forming massive black holes through stellar collisions at early times is the other plausible method that you, through which you might form massive black holes, um, similar to the ones that have been detected um, as members of the black hole binaries. Um, so, so this plot here is simply again showing for uh, this set of n-body models. Uh, the blue points here are showing the black holes that form specifically um, through stellar collisions at early times. And then this black curve here is showing just the simple single stellar evolution track that you would expect in the absence of any dynamical process, um, in the absence of any stellar collisions. So very clearly you can see that as a result of these collisions, you can have a large number of these blue points lying above the single star evolution curve, uh, potentially even filling this gray band, which is indicative of the parent stability mass gap. Um, and then Shorov, you also asked to show the distribution of compact objects. So this is a nice, this is a nice summary plot as well. So this is showing the uh, radial um, distribution of the various populations of stars in a typical cluster at present day. 
So on the top, I'm showing an example of a cluster um, that contains many black holes still. So this is a cluster that will have not yet undergone core collapse. And you can see here that in the central most regions of this cluster, this black curve is dominating the black holes. Um, again, this is, um, this is for the reasons that I was outlining before, the black holes mass segregate and form this very dense subcluster of black holes that dominate the inner regions. And then the yellow curve, the main sequence stars are found at relatively large radii. And such a cluster as is illustrated by this model would have a relatively large core radius. And then on the bottom here, I'm showing a typical cluster which has ejected all of its black holes. As I was showing before, this type of cluster we expect will have undergone core collapse because of the absence of this energy generated by the black holes in the center. And we see here that the innermost parts of the cluster are dominated by uh, massive main sequence stars and especially uh, the white dwarfs, which are shown in blue here. So as their natural consequence, we expect that core collapse clusters are actually uh, the best places to look for um, interesting dynamical processes that might result from um, uh, the interaction of white dwarfs and white dwarf binary mergers, for instance. Great, thanks, Kyle. Um, any questions? Yeah, go ahead, Anindo. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, so, this uh, merger rate estimation for binary black hole merger are only from the binary black holes which are inside the cluster in present day or for all the black holes that have already been ejected at all the inside the cluster. Yeah, you cut out a little bit. I think I heard the question though. So um, these models do indeed take into account self-consistently the formation of the black holes, the ejection of the black holes, uh, the black hole binary mergers that are occurring in the clusters and also the ones that are that are ejected and merge outside of their host cluster. So all of these things are taken into account. Was that, what the, was that the question or did I miss something? Ando, do you have any other question? Yeah, so uh, for this core collapse cluster, there will be a population of binary black hole merger that are not currently inside this cluster, but they have ejected earlier time. So these have already taken into account. Yes, indeed. So although, although we expect the core collapse clusters do not have a large number of black holes retained at present day, they certainly would still have had many black holes earlier in their lifetimes, which would have been dynamically active and would have been ejected. So even though the core collapse clusters don't contain black holes at present, they still would have produced many black hole mergers that would have contributed potentially to the LIGO rate um, throughout their evolution. So indeed, these are taken into account um, in the models. And they will also have high eccentricity to distinguish them from the isolated ones. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, so um, that's sort of one of the key, the key expectations of the dynamical model is you should form highly eccentric mergers, which would potentially be distinct from um, mergers that are occurring through a common envelope process that might lead to circularization. So um, indeed, the eccentricities uh, and the formation in, in particular of highly eccentric black hole mergers are, are accounted for in the model. But the eccentricity may not be observable in the LIGO box, right? Not all of them. Indeed. And it's also a question as to whether LIGO can, is able to actually infer eccentricity. It's not, it's a difficult problem on their, on their end <laughs> in terms of interpreting eccentric waveforms, so. Yeah, I hope uh, Gopu was uh, in the talk. Uh, his uh, group is working a lot on ex uh, creating eccentric uh, waveforms and stuff. Okay, uh, um, I see. Very nice. Uh, Ambrish, uh, you have a question? Uh, yeah, hi. Am I audible? Yes. Hi, Kyle. First of all, 
uh, thanks for a really nice talk and uh, okay uh, i had a couple of very quick questions so first of all on this on the slide that you are already showing in the presentation uh, on the lower panel which is i am assuming a uh, core collapse cluster how do you yep. estimate this core radius which you are showing on the plot yeah so the typical way that the core radius is defined observationally is um, where the surface brightness profile drops by a factor of 2 yes okay so this is the way that we're we're defining the core radius here okay i understand so you can given given a distribution of stars with you know um, inferred luminosities in our model it's straightforward to um, measure a surface brightness profile for the model clusters. Um, and then you can, um, in, in essence, um, infer an observed core radius in the way that you would actually infer an observed core radius for an actual observation. Yes, I understand. Uh, my next question is about the uh, in, uh, in uh, cluster merger channel that you're talking about. So uh, you mentioned that uh, because they are in cluster, so their semi-major axis might not be that uh, compact uh, compared to the ones that have been ejected already. And yep. so we need higher eccentricities. So uh, I was wondering typically what kind of eccentricities do we need such that we can expect this in cluster channel to kick in? Um, yeah, this is a good question. So. Um... So there's two there's 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 two types of eccentricities that are relevant here. There's the eccentricity at binary formation, which will be quite high, um, 0.99 or even some something close to uh, order unity for the eccentricity. But of course, once the binary forms, uh, then it will slowly in spiral, and as binaries in spiral, they lose eccentricity. So. For these in for this in cluster channel specifically, um, the uh, the eccentricity by the time it enters the LIGO band will be relatively small, and essentially near nearly circular. Okay. Um, for these gravitational wave captures specifically, they have even higher eccentricities, even closer to order unity. Um, so these specifically will have high enough eccentricities at formation. Uh, such that when they inspire and into the LIGO band, they will potentially still have measurable eccentricities even in the LIGO band. So um, at, you know, uh, uh, at the LIGO band, they would have eccentricity of maybe 0.1 or 0.2. Um, so, uh, but, but potentially measurable. But for both of these channels, it requires quite high eccentricities, certainly in excess of about 0.9. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Yep. Any other questions for Kyle? All right. Um, if not, let's uh, thank Kyle again and thank you for. Uh, giving this talk uh, and now you can go to bed, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Thanks uh, for the invite. It was nice to join. So good night to you and hopefully we can invite you here in person uh, someday when things are less crazy in the world. Sounds like a good plan. Okay. Bye, Kyle. Bye, everyone. Bye. Hi, everybody.